Uh, we're going to get started just momentarily. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, David Moore with Equity Advantage. And uh, as always, I'll probably be speaking more quickly than uh, some of you want to hear. But uh, anyway, we'll get going in a second. Well, I hope everyone's doing well. It's a little bit toasty here in Oregon this morning. Uh, just for future reference, it is uh, July 27th, 2022. Uh, the stock market is in the green, despite a, the, uh, the obvious uh, impending 75 basis point increase in uh, rates. But uh, we're with uh, tangible assets, real estate, the ultimate tangible assets. So we're going to talk about a variety of things today. We're going to talk about Section 1031, 121, and the DST. So I'm David Moore with Equity Advantage, uh, 1031exchange.com. And uh, thank you very much for joining us today. I always hate to say this, but or hate it when I'm told this, but uh, this seminar will be on YouTube afterwards, actually it'll be available for future viewing. And uh, please uh, take a look at uh, Equity Advantage, uh, like and subscribe, it really helps us out. And if you take a look on YouTube, just search Equity Advantage 1031 on there. You're gonna find a plethora of information on 1031s and even things as, as off 1031 as maybe a life insurance contract. So, we try to be a resource for you if you're a real estate professional and your clientele. And if you've got an idea of something you'd like to know more about, please don't hesitate to reach out. And since we're talking about reaching out, if you are an Oregon broker and you want continuing education for this, you can reach out to C Moore, Celia Moore, C Moore, M O O R E at 1031exchange.com. And she will arrange to get you some CE for this class. And uh, we've got a, a full hour of packed information here, so I'm going to get going at this point in time. Once again, thank you for joining us. Uh, one other housekeeping item. If you look at the right of your screen, there's a little menu there, and there's a section on questions. If you've got a question, you can post that. If I have the opportunity, I'll, I'll get back to you with it, a uh, response. But uh, if I don't get to it during the presentation, we'll be responding via email after the fact. So. Once again, David Moore, Equity Advantage, thank you for joining us, and here we go. So, anybody, uh, I, I know we've got a, a world where they're redefining uh, a recession, but if, if we're talking about inflation, I think it's pretty obvious we've, we've got a lot of inflation here. And if you look at uncertain times, recessionary times or inflationary times, uh, you talk about a flight to quality, tangible assets. Typically, you, we've all heard the ads on, on the radio or seen the ads on TV with precious metals. I would say real estate's the ultimate tangible asset. And even with precious metals, even though they're great, uh, you know, hard assets, you, you're still banking on them going up in value. Real estate doesn't have to go up in value to make you money. You've got somebody else, if it's a leveraged investment, buying the property for you. You've got interest deductions. You've got depreciation you can take. And at the end of the day, it's it's likely uh, it, it, all you got to do is hold it long enough and it's going to go up. I've got a good buddy that that unfortunately recently is deceased, but he said, you know, there's one golden rule of real estate. It, 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 it's do not sell in a recession. So it, he used to say it's it's not a get rich quick scheme. It's a get rich slowly but surely scheme. And, and really the whole secret is just hanging on these things, making a move. Obviously, 1031 is about making things move. 121 also is, and we're going to be talking about both of those. But why real estate today? Obviously, the cash flow is something that's an attractive leverage. You've got the ability to leverage those investments uh, by getting loans, even if it's seller finance, which we haven't been seeing much of the last few years. But I, in the, just in the last uh, probably six weeks, we're starting to see more seller finance transactions coming in. As I said, you got the interest deductions, mortgage pay down, depreciation, appreciation. Uh, and, and, you know, really, like I said, at the end of the day, 
you've got a, a, a situation where you've got a shelter mechanism through either 1031 or 121. Now, Wall Street every so often complains about, well, gee, we don't have Section 1031. Why does real property? Well, a lot of Wall Street's investments, and I know I've got some uh, Wall Street brokers on this call, uh, and I and, uh, love you guys and do a lot of work with you in the DST space, high destry. But uh, you know, if we look at these things, real property actually is considered an alternative investment. And, and it really drives me crazy. How, how can one of the oldest and most time-tested investments known to mankind be considered an alternative investment? But that's what it is. And, and, and same thing with precious metals. So I don't say, I, I don't call real estate an alternative investment. I say it's a real investment. It's real property is a real investment. It's gonna survive the test of time. So if we look at DSTs, you know, why, why would you want to be involved with a DST today? Well, one of the big reasons that, that we're seeing is just rent control in and of itself. I, I'm seeing a fundamental shift in the ownership of real property. If I look at, for example, I'm talking to you from uh, Portland today, and if I just look at rent control and what it's doing to the ownership of properties, you know, our, our government officials put rent control in place to protect the tenants, but they don't understand but those same rules are destroying the mom and pop ownership of those assets. So ultimately I would say that the rent control is causing a fundamental shift in the, in the ownership of property, regional property. You're going from regional ownership from owners that care about the tenants to you know, somebody on Wall Street owning it via REIT or something else, uh, owners that are not regional they, they're, they're going to have a different perspective and some of the costs that are incurred with some of the rent control rules here locally, the, the mom and pops literally can't afford to deal with and they can't afford to deal with the liability. So one of the big reasons that people go into DSTs is, is just a flight from those problems. The, 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 just the hardship of owning a, a, an income property is really difficult. I've got another good buddy, a broker that I saw is on this call and you know, he's a, he's a good old Texan boy, and he told me the story of, of uh, trying to get tenants out of his place, and he fought and fought and fought to do it, finally got him out, and then before he could get somebody else in, some squatters moved in, and he couldn't get help getting them out. So it's really a tough thing, and for the people that are tired of the terrible T's, the DST is a great place. Now, the title of this is 1031-121. And we're going to talk about using both tax codes on a single disposition. If we look at the values of property, Section 121, the universal exclusion for a home sale, was put in place in 1997. 1997, a $250,000 exclusion meant something individually. A half million dollar exclusion meant something for a couple in those days. I would argue that today, that 25500 might need to be, let's say, one and a half and two and a half million or something like that to be the same thing. In 1990, when I moved to Oregon, I mean, the first investment property I bought here was $23,000, okay? I mean, 1997, maybe it was worth $80,000. But today, that same property might be $400,000, $500,000. So it's really a different world that we're living in today, and it's getting more and more uh, you know, out of whack with respect to our inflation and the values of these properties and that universal exclusion is going to be, it already is, woefully inadequate to shelter people's gains on what really is, is their best investment. I, I would still argue in today's world, a home is the best investment you're ever going to make. And, uh, you know, why, why be paying rent your whole life? But we're going to talk about how to convert things and keep your money yours. We like to say you've worked hard for your money. We're going to work hard to keep it yours. So these DSTs are a way to get out of an asset, something, deal with those terrible T's, toilets, trash, tennis, turnover, and go out and buy something that's a passive invest, investment, maintaining your tax deferral. Some DSTs are actually uh, convertible into what's called an upread. So it's the ultimate installment sale. You're buying an asset, the REIT uh, then absorbs, and then you end up with ownership of shares of a REIT. And, and you just literally pay tax as those shares are sold at whatever time period you choose to sell those. Now, obviously you're, you're ending up with a stock, so you can have some fluctuations there in values. But I just think those up REITs are a wonderful opportunity. We're not gonna talk about them today. It's a whole nother class in and of itself. But the DST would give you that option. I also wanna mention that we still have institutional tenancy and common properties that are available for people too. And if we look at institutional tenancy and common properties, 
uh, we're going to see a difference. That, the primary difference I see with DSTs and, and institutional ticks is obviously the tick is, is a limited, finite number of investors that are going. It's a single asset. But the big difference is typically they're not stabilized assets. You're buying a property. Uh, you're buying into a property, tenancy and common interest that's going to then be managed into something else. They're going to create more value over time where DSTs are stabilized assets. Uh, many of the DST offerings are multi-asset offerings. So you're not looking at one, you're looking at a variety of, of assets in a given DST offering. But we've got inventory is always there. So if you've done an exchange in the last probably couple of years, uh, 1031, the biggest headache with any exchange is always time. You've only got that 45 day ID period from the date of disposition to find what you're going to find. And that time period goes very, very quickly. There's no extension short of a presidentially declared national disaster. So it's really important that you're hustling to get things done. People ask all the time, when do I want them to think about an exchange? I would say ideally when they buy the property, but at least when you first contemplate a sale. The first thing I'm gonna want you to do, and this leads me to one statement, uh, we're just one member of a, a, a team of professionals you want in your life. I, I would say good, competent tax people are probably the most important per person in your life. You want to know what the cost of disposition is. So if you contemplate a sale, you want to know that thing. You're going to have good legal counsel on there. You're going to have title escrow people, finance people, property managers, the brokers, obviously. But you want to be working with good people, people that you're paying for their opinions on stuff, people that have been through these things before and understand it. But, uh, you know, that timeline is the toughest thing with 1031. So with DSTs, there's always going to be something available out there. All right, low minimum investments. Typically, you've got a hundred thousand dollar floor on these things. I've seen floors as low as twenty five thousand. What happens is the DST offering, the DST sponsor may have fully subscribed an investment, but they might have, let's say, twenty five, fifty, seventy five thousand outstanding, and they'll sell you that piece of it. So typically, it's a stated minimum of a hundred, but you could get as little as twenty five into that thing. Remote management, you don't have to deal with this stuff. You're buying property all over the country. If I talk to my wife about buying a place in Tennessee, she's going to say, okay, how often do we got to get out there to take a look at it, see what's going on? With the DST, you got somebody else dealing with it. It's totally passive investment. It's that classic mailbox money that's there. Diversification. Not only do you have the ability to to diversify in between different asset types. Uh, for example, you want doors, you want apartments, buy it. You want mini storage, buy that. You want hospitality, you buy that. Uh, there's all kinds of, I mean, there were some Amazon uh, distribution centers that were out there recently. So you can literally pick the type of asset you want to buy into. And then you've also got the ability to diversify and do different DST offerings. So it's not just a single thing, but you can buy multiple DST offerings. So take that, if you got a half million dollars going into it, you can say, okay, what kind of asset mix do I want? And what kind of range or regions do I want? And you can take that 100K and divide it into five different DST offerings in different regions, different types, whatever you want to do. Cash distribution. So you're, you're going to get that, once again, that mailbox money. It's totally passive. Diversification we talked about, low cost of ownership. Uh, you know, that's that's something you can talk to your brokers about, non-recourse debt. So that's a big thing for the DSTs. You see, you've got to be an accredited investor to buy one, but when it comes to buying that asset, you don't have to un, you know open up your life to the finance people to go get a loan to get this thing done. You're buying into something that's non-recourse debt. You don't have to go out and open your life to get that loan to get in that asset. Typically, you're going to have the ability to close these things very quickly, too. So if you sell a property and you need the income off that property to live, if you're retired, you probably don't want the money sitting with me for six months. You'd like to have it working. And these things, if you're working with brokers that are in that space and know what they're doing, they're going to be able to get your money back to work very quickly. You're not going to be losing that income. Uh, li liability protections, DSTs have you know, a, a quote unquote wrapper that protects you from these things. Now I wanna stress something, uh, you're gonna buy, DSTs are, are, are provided through the securities world. So you've gotta buy through an investment you know, broker, somebody's license in securities. And I don't sell these things, I don't get anything if you buy them, I just wanna be totally transparent with this. 
today's presentation is talking about the benefits of it because I've got many, many clients buying these things today. And I think it's important that you know that what's out there and what's possible. And this, this just overview sort of gives you an idea of what you're looking at. So I describe the DST sort of as an, and as an exchangeable real estate investment trust. You cannot invest directly into a REIT with a 1031, but you can get into a REIT if you'd like through one of these convertible DSTs. And one other thing I want to mention, historically, the DST was sort of the place you went you know, with the residual funds. But I've had clients, if I look back in this last year, something that's just changed dramatically is I had a client with $30 million worth of doors that went away. And the entire 30 million went into the DST space. That's something that historically I would not have seen happen. And that's happening more and more all the time uh, in, in today's world. So why do we even talk about this? Why are we talking about section 121, the universal exclusion on a home sale? Why are we talking about 1031? Uh, you know, for investment properties. And, and, and something I want to mention is 121 replaced section 1034, the old residential rollover. We're going to talk about it in depth, but a lot of people are still confused. Even though 121 has been in place since 1997, people still think you've got a one-time lifetime exclusion again via the old 1034. 1033 is another thing you ought to be aware of. If you've got some city, state, municipality uh, taking a property, uh, through eminent domain, and I was talking to real estate brokerage uh, yesterday, and, and they don't think of, uh, they, they don't hear the term 1033 very often, but they hear that term eminent domain all the time. 1033 is a great thing. If you've got the choice of doing 1031 something or 1033 on something, use 1033 because it, you've got up to two years from the due date of the tax return to replace the money. You don't have to replace all the debt into that replacement property. The like kind requirements, as long as that conversion was not uh, via crime or fire or something like that, you, you've got the same like kind requirements at 1031. But and, and you can you know literally take receipt of the funds. You don't need me for that transaction. So once again, 1033 is another tax code that could apply to the disposition if you got. Uh, eminent domain situation and they're very attractive but the reason we talk about all this stuff is gain so gain has absolutely nothing to do with profit on a on a disposition gain is simply a tax calculation all right so if we look at what's happening there uh the the basis in a property is what you paid for the property plus the capital improvements minus depreciation. And actually, I see a question just on the sidebar is DS, what's DST mean? DST is Delaware Statutory Trust. I apologize, I didn't cover that earlier. So once again, DST in the context of today's uh, presentation is a Delaware Statutory Trust. There are something called a, a DST that's a deferred sales trust. We're not going to talk about those. That's a once again, another seminar. But if we look at in, in today's context, DST is as Delaware Statutory Trust, it's an alternative to a, let's say, institutional tenancy and common investment. So back to gain. Okay, gain is simply the difference between the adjusted sales price and the basis of the property. The basis is what you paid for, plus capital improvements minus depreciation. That purchase price, and every time I do this class, I need to put an asterisk next to each of these things because the purchase price, quote unquote, purchase price varies depending on how you got the property. Now, I mentioned my daughter Celia earlier. So if I gave her a property, if I gave her a property, one, I got to understand that I just gave her all the equity in the property. So I've got to be aware of gift, gift tax limitations. And, and as of today, it's still 15,000 per person per year. So if you just quick claim a property to somebody, you're giving them the entire equity in the property. You, the person granting that gift, is you're going to be on the hook for the tax liability on that transfer, not the recipient. So you got to be careful when you're deeding something over what potential tax consequence you might be triggering there. But if I gave her a property, her basis on that property is going to be what my basis was. All right. Now, on the other hand, if I passed away and she inherited the property, she gets a stepped up basis, current market value. Yes, that's still intact, but keep an eye out because the government keeps going after that. They keep wanting to get rid of the stepped up basis. As of today, it's still here and hopefully it will remain here. If I did the old 1034 rollover and new replacement property, 
that was a base carry forward. 1031 is basis carry forward. 1033 would be basis carry forward. So the purchase price isn't necessarily the purchase price in the context of, of calculating this gain. It only is if you're pulling money out of your pocket to go buy this thing. Then we look at the improvements. All right, during the time you own the property, nobody's gonna own a property for very long without having to put money into it. Now, if it's just maintenance type stuff, you're gonna expense those items. So capital improvements will increase the basis. So when I talk to somebody, I say, okay, during the time you've owned this property, how much money have you put into it? And they say, well, gee, I put 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, 100,000, whatever it might be. And, and then we start talking about, okay, so what did you do with that property? And so did you write any of those things off? Oh, I wrote it all off. Well, you expense the items that did nothing for your basis. If you capitalize the items, it increases your basis. Now we get to depreciation. So if you've got a rental house, you buy that property, and I'm gonna throw something else at you. Now, when you buy that property, just, and this is a prime example of good tax people, all right? You buy a rental house, it's typical you're going to make an allocation dirt to the improvements. Now, what happens if you jack the improvement value up or reduce the improvement value? If you jack the improvement value up, you've got more depreciation. Your return on investment is going to increase. If you knock it down, it's going to be decreasing your ROI. So it's really important, ROI's return on investment. So it's really important that you're working with somebody to take full advantage of the depreciation that's possible. If we're talking about a large investment, some big commercial building or investment, now you're gonna look at cost segregation, which is just you know, what I just explained on steroids, because they're gonna take and look at the lighting, the plumbing, they're gonna look at the, the pavement, the, the concrete versus the blacktop, the counters, all these things have different depreciation schedules. And you're gonna work with somebody in that space to do a cost seg study, they're engineering based, and they're gonna accelerate all the depreciation. You don't get more depreciation over the life of an asset, you're just accelerating the depreciation in those different things. So it's gonna increase your ROI. If you're looking at DSTs, typically they're gonna use this cost seg to help those returns, all right? But back to that rental house. So if you go buy a half million dollar rental house, maybe the dirt's worth 100 and the improvements are four, that 400 is going to be written off over 27 and a half years. So depreciation is going to be there. Now, what happens? You say, gee, you've owned the house for the last 10 years. I ask you, okay, did you take depreciation? You say, no, I didn't take depreciation. If you were audited, that that the IRS is going to treat it as though you took it. So their, their position on depreciation, if, if you're in a situation where you've been renting that house, they're going to say, well, you should have taken it, therefore you did. So you, you potentially could be in a situation where you didn't get the benefit of depreciation, and yet you're still on the hook for that depreciation recapture. So once again, it's really critical that you're working with people that understand this, and they're going to help you get where you need to go on it and keep you on the tracks, all right? Now... So your adjusted sales price, it would be the sales gross minus broker's commissions, title escrow fees, tax and legal fees, uh, you know, current property tax, you know, prorations, and that's going to give you an adjusted sales price. You're going to subtract the basis from that number, and that's going to give you your gain. Now, right in the middle of this page is something that we haven't dealt with in the last few years. Now, if we go into a recession and we have erosion of values, and I'm not hearing anyone talk about eroding values in real estate at this point in time. But let's say we had these things happen or you lost a property foreclosure or short sale, you're subject to something called phantom gain because you're saying, well, gee, I lost my property I, or, or I lost to do a short sale. How can I have any gain in that situation? Well, it's pretty simple, all right? In a short sale or foreclosure, the debt on the property is treated as a sales price. So if the debt on the property exceeds your basis, you've got what's called phantom gain. Now, if that happens to you on a primary residence, there's tax relief. If it happens to you with a, an investment, you do not. So it's really important that you understand that. If you're a broker, it's important that you understand that for your clients. If you're an investor, it's important that you understand that. Now, we do lots of exchange. Do. We did a lot of exchanges out of the last crash because of this, all right? Because what happens is the property goes away through foreclosure or short sale, and the tax consequence of that disposition because of phantom gain is often in excess of you pulling money out of the pocket, out of your pocket to go buy something. So, well, how do I do an exchange when I didn't get any money? 
And really what happens is pre-foreclosure, the asset gets transferred to us when it's foreclosed, it's ours. The transfer date from you to us starts at 45 180. We didn't get any money in. And you're just gonna have, have to come out of pocket the money required for a down payment on the replacement property, which in that situation, it could be, it actually is commonly less than what your tax liability would be on that disposition. So that's something that's possible. And you know, a lot of those foreclosures that we dealt with in the last crash were sort of institutional offerings, once again, non-recourse debt. So it didn't actually impact the taxpayer's ability to go out and get a loan. Now, that might be a situation where maybe it did, but if you're going out and you're buying into a DST, once again, you have to be an accredited investor, but you're not having to go out and secure financing for this thing. So once again, that DST could be the, the perfect investment for your up leg in a transaction where you've had phantom gain uh, triggered loss, you know, a lost asset where you're triggering phantom, phantom gain. So we talked about basis gain, what's it cost, right? Now we've got appreciation. So what you make on a property is typically put on what you make in a given year and uh, long-term capital gain. So if it's, if it's, if it's in, inside a year, it's normal income tax. If we're talking long-term long capital gains tax rates, we're looking at a Fed rate of 20%. Typically depreciation is gonna be at 25%. Uh, your states are going state tax. If you've got state tax where the property is, it's going to be on top of that. And then if you make enough, you're still going to be subject to that uh, 3.8 that's the healthcare tax once again. This map I like because it just sort of shows the different states and the different rates. And if you look at the gray states, those gray states are all very, very popular right now because there's no state tax, all right? So, you know, and just sort of food for thought, one of the big problems if we, you know, let's say the group of us goes to buy an asset, if we want to exchange into it, we've got to own a tenancy in common. If we own an asset, let's say we bought a property a decade ago, we probably, and we just pulled money out of our pocket to buy it, we're typically going to be looking maybe at a limited liability company owned asset, so an LLC or some form of legal partnership. Well, partnership interests are specifically prohibited from 1031 treatment. So if we're going in and out of those things, we've always got an issue and when to break it, how to break it. Nine times out of 10 partnership interests get broken at escrow, and that's called a drop and swap. And the vulnerability is that you're, you're personally, it's hard to argue that you personally held the property for investment predisposition. If you own one of these properties in, in one of these gray states, uh, you, you don't have the state chasing you in addition to the federal government on anything that might be a potential issue there. But these gray states are all popular because typically they're, they're you know, that's where you've got ownership rights and, and that's where we don't have any state tax uh, consequences. Now I wanna mention something. Let's say that you're exchanging out of California, let's say with the top rate at 13.3, okay? So you got 20, 25% plus a 13.3 plus another 3.8, you guys can do the math. That's a lot of money to lose on a disposition. Why pay it if you don't have to? And that's why 1031 is so popular. That's why 121 is, is critical also. But it used to be possible that you'd exchange, let's say out of Oregon or California into one of these gray states, hold that property for a year or two, then sell it. And then you would have saved yourself the 13.3 or Oregon can be up to 12% these days if you're Multnomah County and you would save all that money. Well, Oregon saw this happening and they didn't like it. So what they did is they imposed a clawback. And, and so what that means is when you exchange out of the state, Oregon's gonna honor 1031. California saw Oregon do this and they did the same thing. California's also gonna honor 1031. But if there's ever a future taxable sale, those two states are gonna claw back what was deferred out of them. So you can't do this anymore where you're just gonna exchange out California, Oregon and Nevada, Wyoming, you know, Texas, Florida, you know, one of those gray states and get rid of the tax. Now, if you look at the top left of this map, you got Washington that is, is a striped state and you've got another state, New Hampshire, that is also, uh, I'm going to talk about Washington in that Washington has capital gains at this point in time. Uh, it, it, the state taxes are aimed at, let's say, unfortunately, Microsoft or Amazon, maybe, you know, as far as the shareholders there. So, but with respect to real estate, real property, there's no 
you know, state capital gains tax right now in Washington, it applies to real property. Uh, there's been a lot of battling. The reason it doesn't apply to real estate is the the you know, Washington Association of Realtors, NAR, fortunately, you know, really fought it and said, hey, look, you do that, you take 1031 away, you hit people with capital gains in this state, people are just going to stay away from investing in the state. And that's true. I mean, I've been doing this for 32 years. I know what happens to states when they impose or don't allow you to defer the state tax. You know, Pennsylvania is the only one right now that, that doesn't allow it, but we're only talking, you know, a few points on that. So it's really not that much. But if you go back to imagine if, you know, if, if California was just not going to allow you to get out of the state without paying the 13.3, you think anyone's going to buy there? Be a tough sale. So this map sort of tells you what you're looking at on a state level. So what is Section 121? Section 121, as I said earlier, replaced Section 1034 in 1997. Now, 1997, before 121, we had 1034. It said that when you sold a home, you had two years to buy a new home of equal or greater value. And uh, as long as you did that, you were going to be fine. You didn't have to spend all the money. You just had to go out and buy a new home of equal or greater value. Uh, the, the gain uh, that was in the one property is shifted to the next. So if you sold a home of 100K, yeah, you, with gain, you go forward and you've got, you know, a new basis on the property, replacement property, you know, just simply subtract 100 from the purchase price. That's going to be roughly the basis on that trend, on that property. Now, it, it also said if you're 55 or older, you had a one-time lifetime exclusion of $125,000. Now, I would argue that 1034 is a better rule for most home sales today than 121 is. So when 121 came in, it offered up some great opportunities, but it said, hey, individually a quarter million dollars, a married couple has a half million dollar exclusion on gain. You can do this once every two years. I wanna stress this. Once again, you can take this exclusion once every two years. Now, if you read the code, it sort of says it can only apply to be, you know, once every two years, but that's not an absolute. You're going to find in tax law rarely is in black and white. There's lots of variables there. So if you look at 121, it could be applied to multiple sales as part of one action. What do I mean by that? You could have a home, you could have maybe a, a lot that was partitioned off that, that used to be your backyard, and that whole thing, those two properties were used as your home for years. Now, you know, you've got a situation where 121 says to qualify for the 250 or 500, you have to have lived in the property for two out of the preceding five years. Now, that doesn't mean you're living it at the time of sale. It just means any two year period out of the preceding five. So 121 applies to anything that fits the two out of five. It's not what the property is at time of disposition. So if you're a broker, think about this. Somebody lived in a home. You go out on a listing appointment, you look at this property, and it appears to be a rental property. Ask the people, did you ever live there? If they did, when did they move out? If they moved out a year ago, boom, now we've got a situation where they can still apply 121. Maybe they moved out two years ago. Well, you can still apply 121. They moved out two years and 10 months ago. Well, that tells you that you got to get this property sold within two months or they're going to be outside that two out of five. Because as soon as three years you know, eclipses, now they're stuck with 121. They don't have the ability to use 121 at all. So once again, it's, it's an aggregate two-year residency out of the preceding five to qualify for 121. It could be applied to multiple sales as long as it's one action. You can only use this thing once every two years, all right? It's it's pretty nice deal. I would just love to see the numbers bounced up dramatically. 1031 applies to real property held for investment. Uh, we used to be able to do exchanges of personal property too. Now, 1031 is over 100 years old at this point, and there are still many people that don't know it exists, all right? So make sure that, that if you're looking at these things, 1031 applies to real property today. We used to be able to do personal property, uh, used to do lots of high-end cars. Those of you that know me love I, know that I love cars, and uh, we used to have a lot of fun with that, so did my brother. And uh, unfortunately, in Trump's tax reform 2017, we lost personal property. So we can't do businesses any longer, we can't do aircraft any longer, can't do those cars, can't do artwork. Uh, and, and if you're looking at disposing or relinquishing one of those things, 
you might want to talk to somebody about a QOZ or an OZ, Qualified Opportunity Zone or Opportunity Zone. Now, if, since we're talking about DSTs today, some of these DST sponsors offer up Opportunity Zones also. So you want to make sure, you know, take a look at this stuff, understand these things are development plays. I look at OZs as a sort of like a Roth IRA where you've got limited deferral into the asset. And then if you hold it through maturity, what you make on that asset is going to be tax free. But, you know, once again, that's a whole nother seminar. If you've got questions on OZs or QOZs, just type in on YouTube, Equity Advantage. QOZ, OZ, or Opportunity Zone, you're going to see a whole, whole series of, of, of videos on that topic. And I interviewed a, a tax attorney that specializes in this stuff, Connie Rathbone. She did a great job. We're actually going to update that series because it was done a few years ago. But there are regional DST offerings also, uh, that are regional OZ offerings as well. And, you know, if, if you look at for example, the Las, uh, Las Vegas Raiders, uh, the new stadium there was built in a QOZ. So that's something else that's out there. But, uh, you know, 1031 is, is something I'm going to say 1031 is better for real estate to real estate transactions than OZ is. Keep in mind the OZ's got the same 180 day timeline 1031 is. So don't look at the OZ as a fallback for 1031. If you think you want to go into an OZ because you're not finding things, it's important that come, that come day 45 in the exchange, do not, uh, do not identify anything, terminate your exchange at that point in time. The money can then leave your exchange account on day 46 if you didn't ID anything. If you ID'd something, rescind the ID prior to midnight 45th day and then you get access to that money. If you, if you ID properties and you're now outside the 45 days and you want to now go into the OZ, you're not gonna be able to do that because we can't release those funds outside what's called 1031 G6, all right? If you got further questions on that, you know, give us a shout. But uh, once again, if you're giving up an aircraft, a business, uh, some car you made a fortune on, artwork, and you want to get into real estate, you're going to look at an OZ or a QOZ. And as I stated earlier, a lot of those, uh, not a lot, but several of the big sponsors in the DST space are offering up OZs as well as the DST offerings and upreads. All right. Uh, we look at 1031 as domestic property for domestic property. Okay, that's the deal. Partnership interests, as I said, are specifically prohibited, so we have to do a drop and swap or swap and drop. Once again, that's another class. Uh, what, one other thing, uh, we all hear the ads for people flipping property. Those things don't qualify. That's dealer status. It doesn't work for 1031, and you're stuck paying normal income tax. So I, I would be very careful with that. I got into the exchange business because my brother and I were buying properties. We we're fixing them up. Uh, you know, you, you hear people talk about this Burr. You know, I got to love the acronyms today. But Burr, you know, the Burr concept or Burr strategy: buy, rehab, refi, and repeat. Okay. Now I, I would throw another, you know, hitch in there, and and you know, we were doing that over 30 years ago with properties, but we would always buy it, rehab it, refi the thing, get it all stabilized a year or two after acquisition when our equity got to a point it no longer made sense to keep the thing, we would then exchange out of it and keep moving those things because you snowball your assets over time. And if you're just buying, fixing and turning stuff, you're losing over half of it to tax potentially if you're making much money there because you're looking at normal income tax and you don't have the ability to do uh, a 1031 as well. Now, even if you took a, over a year to buy and improve that property, if you never rented the thing out or just ha had it sitting there stabilized, it doesn't matter that you held it for more than a year, you're still looking at normal income tax. So I would say, if you look at that process, buy it, rehab it, you know, rent the thing out, refi the property, and the money you get via the refi is typically going to be in excess of even in today's world, excess of what you'd net after paying the taxes if you sold the thing. So I really just don't get that whole, you know, buy, fix, turn. You know, you, you're going to learn at some point that flipping properties doesn't make sense. Uh, and, and this is the way you shelter these things. So RevProc 2005-14 uh, was, you know, was, was put in place to show how we can blend on a, on a single disposition, 1031 and 121, into an asset and basically it just says it spells out how you're going to determine the computation of the gain through these things and uh, we do a lot of these transactions 
And the reason it's really important is we're talking about 121 today, and I told you it's 250 or 500 exclusion, which in today's world is woefully inadequate. So we've got many, many clients. So historically, we've had lots of people that were exchanging out of an investment property into a new investment property, seasoning it, moving into it, and then they would sell it. Now, that process went away, and we're going to talk about it a little bit more, but there's reasons to convert an investment into a residence, and there's reasons to go residence into an investment. We do both of those things, and it just requires time to get it done. So a few fallacies of the exchange world, these things come up all the time. I just want to dispel them real quickly. A lot of times people say, well, gee, you know, like kind requires a, a like kind investment. 1031 requires like kind. Like kind has never meant house for house, land for land. Okay, in the late 90s, there was a proposal that would have made it uh, house for house, land for land, but it's never been that way. So, like kind refers to the nature of the investment rather than the form. Any real property held for investments, like kind with any real property acquired with the intent to hold for investment. Two, section 1031 does not require two year hold. Now, if I swap a property with my brother, who's, who's my partner in this firm, if we swap properties, that's a related party transaction. And in that transaction, or you know, let's say I wanna buy a property from him and he wants to go do something else. We do a related party transaction. We have each got to do the exchange and we each have to hold our respective replacement properties for no less than two years. That leads to a lot of confusion in the code. 1031, if it's an arm's length transaction, you're just selling John Smith down the street and buying from Susie down the street, and they're not related to you, there's absolutely no required hold in the code. One year's been proposed a couple times, and if you look at the break between short long-term uh, tax rates on assets held for investment, it's one year, so that's what I'd like to see ideally, all right? Three. There's no limit to the number of properties relinquished or received. So a lot of times people look at the ID rules and there's three different ID rules that, that exist. The first one's a three property rule. Second one says you can ID more than three. Total value can't exceed 200% of the relinquished property's value. Third rule says you can exceed three, exceed 200%. You gotta close 95% of the aggregate value of all properties ID. You're closing literally everything you've identified. Uh, those ID rules, I think, confuse people because They'll say, well, gee, the ID rule says three properties. That doesn't mean you can't exchange out of or into more than three, okay? We can we can aggregate a dozen different relinquished property in a single replacement, or we can do the opposite. So there's no cap in value. The ID rules just get more complicated as you get up in numbers. So it's really important, and you know, back to my comment earlier about when I want you to think about an exchange, when you buy it ideally because that's going to dictate how you own things uh and, and at least when you consider a sale so you can understand what your tax liability is and you're going to start looking for replacement properties before you ever you know have a sale pending because that 45 day time period goes very very quickly all right uh Four, you can carry a note or land sale contract and still do an exchange. So as I said earlier, we hadn't seen many seller carrybacks recently. We're seeing more of them these days. So a note trust deed, if you look at the sale, purchase sale agreement and, and look at a transaction, it doesn't say total cash paid, it's to, it says total consideration. But if you want to sell and carry a note and trust deed, you can do that. You've just got, you've just made your life more complicated, all right? Because what will happen is when that property sells, just as in any other exchange, the money will come to us. The note would become ours. We'd be the beneficiary of that note and trust deed at the time of close. If we're not, you've got a problem. Now, what happens if you sold and carried a note, and then two years from now, you've got a balloon payment coming in, and now you want to do an exchange? Too late, you can't do it. So if you're carrying paper and you want to do an exchange, it's important you talk to us before it closes because we're going to have to address that thing. And, and like I said, typically the note's going to become ours and we've got a variety of things we can do with it moving forward. Five, you don't have to replace debt in exchange. This drives me crazy. And, and it really impacts people a lot more in recessionary times because the loan to values uh, decrease. And a lot of times you've got a situation where the value of the properties decrease, so you've got less equity. And inevitably, you've got to come out of pocket more money to go buy what you're going to buy. Or maybe you just 
Yeah, debt on the relinquish. You don't want any debt on the replacement. So debt can go away two ways. One by going down in value, which triggers tax because you went down in value. The other way debt goes away is by adding cash to a transaction, which is always fine. So you can offset mortgage boot, boots anything that's received that's not of like kind. You can offset mortgage boot with cash. You cannot offset cash boot with mortgage. So you can always add money to a deal, but you can't offset you know, cash received with mortgage and have that with tax deferral, all right? Finally, this is something else that's really important in today's world because maybe you're doing a, an exchange and you want to take $100,000 out and pay off some other debt, or maybe you want to take $10,000 out, go take a trip. 1031 is not all or nothing. So whatever your basis is on a property, every dollar you spend over that basis represents tax deferred gain. It's up to you and your tax people to decide what at what point it ceases to make sense. Now, we're talking about gains on dispositions of property, but you might have losses somewhere else. Now, I want to stress a loss of value in an IRA or 401k is not a loss you can realize. That's just a reduction in the balance in your retirement account. But if you've got personally owned stocks and you might have a loss somewhere, or you lost someplace, some money someplace else, maybe those losses can be used to offset the gain on this situation, and that'll help you get things taken care of. All right. So it's up to you. Every, whatever your tax basis is, every dollar spent over the basis represents tax deferred gain. So this this slide basically look at and say, well, what am I selling? 121 is a primary residence. As I said, it applies anything that fits that two out of five. 1031 applies to investment property. Now, can you think of any a circumstance where both codes might apply? The obvious one is a duplex that's half owner occupied. So you'd have one sale with allocations dirt, allocations the improvements. Maybe you've got a large home with on acreage. Well, you have an allocation to the home, that primary residence, section 121, and the working land would be 1031 in that situation. Now we've got a lot of people through COVID started working at home. Maybe your tax people say, hey, you know what? You're working out of your house. Let's treat a portion of your home as a home office. And now if you sold that property, if you get outside of the two out of the preceding five that 121 requires, you have a situation where you thought you sold your home, but that home office has to be 1031 exchange. So that's just a few examples of a single asset with allocations to two different directions. And just as you're looking at it on a disposition, you can look at these allocations on an acquisition too. So you, it's not one or the other, it could be both. And you've got to be aware of both sections to keep your money yours and keep you going where you want to go. Your next question is, well, gee, how do I convert assets from one thing to the next? Well, pretty simple. It's not like you're filing anything if you move you know, let's say you buy a property via 1031 and then you want to move into it. You buy that property at the beach, well, you're going to buy it, hold it for a period of time. Now, we talked about seasoning periods earlier. And, you know, the government's actually even acknowledged you can go out, exchange out of a pure investment into a new investment property and season it and then move into it and sell it. And in that situation, uh, you know, it used there was a there was a window of opportunity, right when section uh 121 came in well we had clients buying a property hold it for a year or so move into it live in it for two years sell it and they take the exclusion give it all the gain if it was within the 250 or 500 now you know one caveat is depreciation recapture would have been recaptured but other than that it would have been all gone now the government saw that happening and the first thing they did to try to stop that or slow the tide is they put a five-year required hold on a property acquired via via 1031 and converted to your residence and, and you know, your next question, well, you know, how, do I, how do I define primary residence? And a lot of you may have, you know, especially if you live in the Northwest, you, you're, you're, you probably get tired of the gray during the winter. And, and so lots of people have a property down in the desert and you might spend more time in the desert than you do here. Well, you could have two different properties that both qualify for 121. You can only use it once every two years. Now you could be in a situation where uh, you can do it on both. You just have to stagger them by two years in that scenario. But if, if we look at these things, it, we're talking about conversion of assets and, and that five-year hold slowed things down. So if you bought a property via 1031, you sold it in fi inside five years of acquisition, it's going to be a fully taxable sale. Once again, I'm going to say that it will be a fully taxable sale if you sell a property acquired via 1031 and converted to a residence and then ultimately sold you're going to have a problem there if it's sold inside five years. After the five years, you're going to have something called the Housing Assistance Tax Act. 
Uh, and, and, you know, this actually, this slide talks about a court case where four months was deemed long enough. This is a recent case. These people argued hardship. They bought a property, and this talks about seasoning on things. And as I said earlier, I'd like to see a year of seasoning before uh, you convert or dispose of a property. So that year after acquisition, hold it, season as investment, then move into it. I'd like to see at least a year uh, for that. Uh, if we're talking about converting a primary residence into investment, I'd like to see probably at least a year there also for those reasons I previously mentioned that one year has been proposed a couple of times and that's a break between short and long-term tax rates. So I think you can defend that. Ultimately, these timelines are up to you and your tax people, all right? Rarely in the tax world is it black and white, it's gray. You need to take advantage of those tax professionals in your life and get good ones. When we're looking at the acquisition of a property and holding things, because people say, well, the code says two years, as I said, that only applies to related party transactions. Depends what's happened there. What in your life is, is dictating a change? That's going to dictate the old. Okay. So in the recent case, these people bought a property via 1031, moved into it after four months. They got audited got taken to court, they prevailed in court. They argued that they, they, they could not rent out the property, they documented showings, documented listings, couldn't rent the thing out, couldn't afford to own the new investment property and their home, so they moved into it, sold their home. Uh, you know, once again, this is one court case, uh, four months in this case, I wouldn't hang my hat on four months, I'd wanna see at least a year. I think that's much more defendable, but you talk to your tax people with respect to how long is long enough. So, as I said, you buy a property, convert it from investment to residence, and then you go to sell it. And this Housing Assistance Tax Act is going to be there, and, and, and that hits you. So, even if you hold it for more than five years, this sort of plugs the gap there. So, what it says is, yes, you can buy a property via 1031. You can convert the property from, from investment to residence. It's not a problem. If you hold it for more than five years, you're not, even after the five years, you're not going to get the full 250 or 500. You're going to get a proration of the 250 or 500. That that two, that two proration is, is attributable to the gain that's attributable to the qualified versus non-qualified use period. So the qualified use period is the time you lived in the property. The non-qualified use is the, the you know, time from January of 09 to the date of conversion. So let's say you had a dozen years of non-qualified use, you had three years of qualified use, well, you're gonna get a quarter of the exclusion. So don't think that you're ever gonna get the full 250 or 500. Obviously, the longer you're there, the better off you are. I tell people, look, if you wanna buy something, convert it into your residence, do it, but do it with the idea you're going to be there for the foreseeable future, not something to just get rid of the gain because it doesn't work any longer. It was a great idea that's time's come and gone. These are the four cornerstones. I like simple. This is what I look at with any exchange. When somebody comes to me, you know, they're going to sell something, they're going to buy something. We're going to turn this thing into an exchange. All right. So phase one is what they give us, phase two is what we give them back. And so it's got to be an exchange. The exchange is not between the taxpayer and the buyer or seller. It's going to be between the taxpayer and the exchange company. All right. Two, the items relinquished and received must be of like kind. We talked about that earlier. It's the nature of the investment rather than the form. Any real property held for investments like kind with any real property acquired with the intent to hold for investment. Three tells us what we have to do to be totally tax deferred. We call it the napkin test. It's called the napkin test because a, a tax lawyer, uh, you know, in, in the good old days, uh, Marvin Starr came up with this. He, he wrote the formula down during a break in a seminar, hence the napkin test. And then what it says, you've got to go across or up in value and equity between the relinquished and replacement properties for total tax deferral. So I didn't say anything about debt. And you know, once again, I, I want to stress debt can go away two ways, one by going down in value, uh, triggers tax, you went down value. The other white debt goes away is by adding cash, which is always fine. Four, we must have continuity of vesting. Now, anybody in uh, in the seminar that's been through an exchange will tell you time is the biggest headache. It clearly is. The second biggest problem we have is vesting. And investing used to be a problem. It just means the way a property is hold it, relinquishment needs to be the same as, as replacement acquisition. 
This is how easy it gets to be a problem, okay? As I said earlier, partnership interests are specifically prohibited. So anytime we've got multi-owner, or multi-member LLC, and we've got people wanting to go in different directions, that's a vesting issue because that partnership interest, the membership interest in the LLC is not exchangeable, so we have to break that entity, do a drop and swap or a swap and drop. But if, if we're looking at, let's say, I'm talking to you from Oregon, Oregon's not a community property state. So imagine you go out and you buy a rental house and you get another rental house and you get another rental house. Then your lawyer says, hey, you know what? You got to shove these rental houses into an LLC because you got too much liability out there. So you sell the property that's in the LLC and you want to go out and go buy the new property. Now, a lot of times I hear, well, you can't, you can't finance an LLC. That's totally untrue. It certainly can, and, and a lot, large investments almost require LLCs. But if we're looking at a residential loan, they're typically not going to allow an LLC to take ownership. So spouses in the state of Oregon, it's not a community property state, cannot give up a property in an LLC and receive the replacement property personally. Now, if you're in California or you know any, any community property state, you could relinquish a property in the LLC and receive the replacement property individually, that's fine. But this is a state to state issue here, and that's how easy vesting gets to be a problem. This slide just talks about different types of exchanges, swaps, delayed exchange, reverse exchange, improvement exchange, warehousing swaps. You know, if you've got a property, I've got a property, each property is the same value and equity, and we each want each other's property, that can be done with a simple swap agreement. Uh, you know, as I said, a purchase sale agreement, you've got total consideration. If you've got a small property, you want to use it for acquisition, a big one, you can literally swap that property, use it as consideration for the purchase of the replacement. That would be a swap. Delayed exchange is, is what we typically look at in today's world. You sell a property, you've got 45 days from settlement to ID what you want to buy, 180 days to buy that thing. A reverse exchange means we're going to buy first, sell later. Now, I want to stress something here. You can't buy the property without us, okay? If you buy the property and then you later want to do an exchange, if you own it, you legally cannot have ownership of the new and old property at the same time. So a reverse exchange is going to require you only own the new property or the old property, and, and, and basically it's called a warehouse replacement or a warehouse relinquished, and that, once again, is another class. Uh, if you want information on that, just type in Equity Advantage, uh, Reverse Exchange on YouTube. You're going to see videos on that. Uh, so a warehouse replacement reverse exchange means we're taking ownership of the new property. An improvement exchange is the same structure as a warehouse replacement reverse exchange. It just means that we're going to be building on that property during the time we have ownership of it. All right. Warehousing transactions or any type, of, any type of exchange where we're taking ownership to a property. Typically, it's gonna be with respect to a reverse or improvement exchange, but a warehouse transaction, imagine, so remember I just mentioned giving or, or, or using a property as consideration for a property, all right? Now, let's say you've negotiated a sale of a property, the buyer's coming in with cash and with a property, but you don't want that property, you've agreed to the terms of the transaction. So what happens is at disposition, the money comes to us, the property gets deeded to us, and we stay on title to the property and, and, until it's sold, and then that money is, then, then we've got that property has been converted to cash, we go forward. You, if, if you would take an ownership of the property, immediately put it on the market, the one you didn't want, you didn't hold it for investments, so you couldn't do an exchange with it later. So it's important anytime we're looking at warehousing things that it gets structured correctly uh, from inception. This talks about like kind, and I want to point to the 10 o'clock. Uh, there's a 30-year lease actually constitutes ownership of prop, real property or lease with uh, you know extensions to 30 years. And uh, you know, once again, that's something we're dealing with a fair amount in different situations. Some of the property, you know, the properties in Hawaii are leasehold interest a lot of times, maybe in the desert, Indian owned stuff, you got leasehold interest. Even uh, let's say if you live in the Northwest, you got a property up in government camp, a lot of that's uh, government land with leases. The napkin test, as we talked about value and equity requirements, the italicized section, just to, just above where it's bolded with boot, says you may offset mortgage boot with cash, cannot offset cash boot with additional mortgage. Continuity of vesting, we talked about that, but it's really important that you look at things and understand you make changes in ownership. Every time you make a change in ownership, you've got a seasoning period there. This vesting 
uh, issue is a big one in 1031. Like I said, it's it's second only to time with with the transaction. All right. This is the steps of the transaction. The taxpayers in the middle. Uh, the you know, buyer's going to buy the property. Ownership flows us to the buyer. If you look at a settlement statement. It's going to show us as a seller, the exchanger reading and approving everything. We've got a deed directly from the exchanger to buyer. Uh, I am running out of the one hour period, so I apologize. I've probably got a few more minutes to go. If you need to go, I understand. If you want to hang out for a few more minutes, please do. I think you get a lot out of it. But in this diagram, we're in the middle of it. So phase one, they give us a property. We sell it. Phase two, we buy what they're going to buy give it back to them and and the deeds we use direct deeding unless it's a warehouse transaction the deed's going to go straight from the taxpayer to the buyer and straight from the seller to the taxpayer unless it's a reverse exchange or it's an improvement exchange timelines of 45 180 i want to stress that both start simultaneously at the date of transfer the settlement date there's no extensions on this short of a presidentially declared national disaster. Now, depending on region of the country you're in, you may see extensions every year. Uh, if we're looking at the West Coast, they're probably very rare. Uh, the last time we had them on the West Coast were one, due to COVID, two, uh, due to fires. So it's got to be a presidentially declared national disaster to have any extensions granted. You can ID things anytime up until midnight, the 45th day. You can change your ID all the time. Uh, the 180 day is obviously 180 days. Now, I want to stress you, exchange is done late in the tax year. You want to make sure you complete the exchange before you file a tax return. So if, if you're looking, staring at April 15th, you haven't completed the exchange, you should file an extension so you can get the exchange completed before filing that return. These are the identification rules I mentioned earlier. You've got three different options, the three property rules. So any you can ID up to three properties of any value. Identification doesn't mean you've got a deal pending. It just means you're giving what the government would deem an unambiguous description. It could be a common address, including city, state, and zip, all right? So three properties of any value. The second one says you can ID more than three. Total value of the property's ID cannot exceed 200% of the relinquished property's value. Now, that, that can be an interesting one because what is a property worth? Does a property have to be listed to be identified? And the answer is absolutely not. You don't have to have a property listed to buy a property. You can go directly to the seller of the property, buy something. So when you're looking at values, you're looking at probably what you'd be paying for the property, not what you know what is stated necessarily, but there's some you know some fudge room there that, that can be there. And then your third option is one I rarely see used because it basically says you can ID more than three, the value can exceed 200%, but you got to close 95% of the ag aggregate value of all properties identified. Now, if if our, our you know, participants today have done much in the way of real estate, I'm sure you've had a sale fail. All right, so this means that if you ID 10 properties, you're buying, you know, all of them basically. So that's a tough one to get done. And I really encourage people, you know, if you put a property in the market, the last few years, you put a property in the market, you have multiple offers and, and it was nuts, right? So you, you want to ask for whatever time you feel you need to find what you want. Don't just list a property, put it on the market, get an offer this weekend and have somebody with cash wanting to close the next Friday. And now you got the 45, 180 going and, and ticking away and you're losing sleep over it. So ask for whatever time you feel you need to get the deal done. And as I stated earlier, you can go ahead and make the offers on the replacement property before the relinquished one sells. If you've put earnest money down on the replacement, we can reimburse you the earnest money when we go to buy the property uh, for you. So don't wait around, get things going. Now, this slide's very important in today's world because this is something that comes up more and more. If you've got a transaction and you start and, and you need to terminate this thing, this deal, get your money out, we're subject to any exchange company that gives your money, gives people money outside what's called 1031 G6, you've got a problem. That exchange company's not following the rules. Every exchange they've done following procedures that don't follow the rules is invalid, all right? So if you're in an exchange, back to my comment on the opportunity zones earlier, you need to understand when you've got access out money. When you go out and you acquire or you relinquish a property, 
that money comes to us. If you want to pull money out of a deal and you know you want to, you can get it out at settlement and it's excluded from the exchange. Or if it gets to us, you can't get it from us for any reason inside the 45 days because you can ID things, all right? So 1031 G6 says you can't receive it until you've received everything you have the right to buy. Inside the 45 days, you can ID anything. So you don't have the right to that money because you can do whatever you want at that point. Now, on day 46, if you haven't identified anything, you can then get the money. If you've identified something on day 20, let's say, and you get to day 44, 45, and you're going, gee, I don't think I want it, rescind the ID and we can give you the money on day 46. Don't just put a property there just in case, because what happens if you ID something just in case, and now we're on day 60 and you find what you really want, and now you want your money? I can't give you your money for that thing, all right? So we can only give you the money for what you have identified and you have the right to buy. So as I said earlier, if you're in a situation where you know you want money out, pull it out at settlement. If the money comes to us and you say after the fact, gee, I'd like to get 10,000 out, go take a trip. What I'm gonna tell you is if you're identifying, let's say the three property rule, the ID three properties, you only intend to buy one. In our ID form, there's a little blank that says I'm IDing these properties, but that I have the right to only buy one property. You put that in there, or maybe you want two, you put two in there, or you want all three, you put three, but let's say you only want one, you're IDing three with the intent to buy one. As soon as you've per you put one in that blank, as soon as you purchase that one, you're outside the 45 days. Even though you ID three properties, you don't have the right to buy the other two. Therefore, we can release that money. Okay. So it's really important you understand when you have access to money and don't just flippantly put something on there just in case. End games. All right. Let's say you're just tired. You say, okay, I'm tired of dealing with the properties, don't know where I want to go but I, I'm just tired. So you can swap till you drop. As I said earlier, you get stepped up basis to current market value, everything's still good. The next option would be to do that exchange into a retirement residence as we talked about earlier. And that works great. Just understand what's there, understand the five year old, understand the Housing Assistance Tax Act. So do that with the idea you're gonna be there for the foreseeable future. And exchange until it makes tax sense. What do I mean by that? Maybe you're retiring. Maybe last year or this year made a killing, and next year you don't think, hey, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna make that much. So, or, or maybe you've got losses to offset the gains. That's what I mean by exchange until it makes tax sense. Exchange into a passive investment, a DST or, or an institutional tenancy in common property. Those things are gonna give you passive investment. You're not having to deal with those terrible T's of, of ownership. Okay. An upread, an upread. Like I said earlier, I feel is sort of the ultimate installment sale, but it's better in a lot of ways because on an installment sale, one of the sort of hidden landmines of an installment sale, I think, is that you sell and everybody thinks, well, gee, I didn't receive any principal payments. I don't have any tax. So number one, make sure if you've got installment sale, you're getting enough of a down payment to cover all your closing costs. All right. If, if you're doing something with an exchange, I, you know, I'd like to get paid. Escrow wants to get paid. Uh, you know, if you're the broker in the deal, you'd like to get paid. So, you know, make sure you get enough to cover all those closing costs. You're not having to come out of pocket and pay the closing costs. But the other thing that comes up on installment sales is you're, you're taxed on debt relief and depreciation recapture in the year of disposition, even if you didn't receive any principal payments. So you've got to be aware of that. All right. So the upgrade sort of gets you away from that because you're completing the exchange into an asset totally tax deferred. That asset is then being converted into shares of the, of the real estate investment trust. So installment sales can be great in game. I mean, if you if you sell a property and put the money in the bank, one, you got to pay the tax. Two, what's the bank going to pay you? Uh, you know, obviously today it's 75 basis points better than it was yesterday, but still it's nothing. Uh, so you just understand, hey, I'm doing this. What am I going to make on that money? Uh, and that structured sale is, is basically an installment sale. Uh, the other thing with installment sale, you got to worry about somebody defaulting or accelerating a payment. So if you're doing the installment sale with the intent of receiving income over time, you want to make sure you've got something, have an acceleration provision in there that gives you some relief. Otherwise, you could do that sale, 
and you take that installment sale and you're getting these payments and a year or two later, boom, all of a sudden the, the property is sold, the new buyer doesn't want it, or maybe uh, the, the owner wants to do a, a refinance of it. Now you're getting hit with this big payment. And as I said earlier, I can't help you with that. So make sure that you're being taken care of. Uh, and make sure that you've got things in there to take care of things in the default. A structured sale gets you away from the you know, potential of a buyer defaulting. And a structured sale, what happens is, is the obligation to pay gets shifted to a third party assignment company. Typically it's a whole life company and you pick the term that you'd like to get paid. And that those things are, are very attractive and work well for people. Deferred sales trust is another opportunity out there. Charitable remainder trust. You've got some charity, some 501c3 that you'd like to give a property to. There's reasons to do that. If you've got questions on that, once again, you can type in on YouTube, Equity Advantage, Charitable Remainder Trust. Uh, one of my people in here, Tina Colson, worked in that space for a decade and she can talk to you about that. The gifting's an opportunity. You've got a property you're giving up. You've got a couple of kids. You want to give each kid a property. So you complete the exchange and the property for each one of them. If you give them the entire property, once again, you just gifted them the entire equity, that might trigger tax. So what I would say is buy the property, shove each one into an LLC, and then start doing an assignment of membership interest over a number of years. Now, if you, got, if you gift a, a minority interest in a property to that kid, it, it, you can discount that value by up to 40%. So that's a very attractive thing when you're looking at gifting. So once again, talk to your tax people about that because that's a tremendous opportunity for people. You know, one example that I did not give that I want to talk about before closing this out is, is you know, as an example I give in presentations all the time, we had a, had a client with a $3 million gain on disposition of property in, in, in California. Uh, they got referred to us by a law firm. We told them to move out of the property. So they were looking at $3 million gain. The 250, 500 was gonna do nothing for them. So we told them to move out of the house, season as an investment. They, they held it for a year. Uh, they bought the home, the new home they wanted to live in, moved into that. After a year, they sold their home. It was uh, that what was their home was now an investment property, sold that property. They actually bought 24 properties, 24 different replacement properties. They closed them all inside the 45 day time period. And, and the reason they got it done inside the 45 is, is uh, this couple, the, the uh, you know, husband was a lawyer, the wife was a CPA, and she knew the consequences dealing with the 95% rule. So she got all 24 purchases done inside the 45 days. They went from a million dollar tax hit to zero tax and got all those properties out of the deal. So that's an example of relinquishing a property that had gains well in excess of the 250 and 500. And when they sold that thing, that rev proc I showed earlier talks about how you treat this. They were still entitled, in, in as long as they sold it within three years of moving out, they were still able to take the exclusion, 1031, the overage. And they went from, like I said, a million dollar tax it to zero by using that process, converting those assets. Now, this just talks about, you know, we do self-directed retirement accounts for people who want to take their Irish 401ks, go buy real estate, do business startups, that stuff. Post 1031's property listing site, 1031exchange.com is where you find me uh, most of the time. And then this is, uh, please, you know, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. It really helps us out. Follow us. We we send information. Uh, Celia, my daughter in here, is, is head of our our uh, social media marketing and the YouTube's just all our videography. But uh, if you've got questions on something you don't see, please let us know. And uh, she can be reached at cmore, C-M-O-O-R-E at 1031change.com. But uh, we also, she sends out extensions, uh, sign up for our newsletters too, because anytime we have one of these presidentially declared disasters, we get information out through our different channels. And uh, you know, like I said, it's gonna keep you on top of stuff and any potential legislation that's gonna impact uh, 121, 1031, 1033, stepped up basis, all those things are gonna be out there. But David Moore, thank you very much for your time today. Really hope it was helpful to you. And remember, the only dumb question is the one that's not asked. And as I said, if you need credit for this thing, please uh, reach out to see more at 1031. And all my best to everyone out there, stay cool. And uh, thank you once again for joining us. Take care, bye-bye.